Hi, I'm John Stevens. This is Matt Russell. And this is Pod Have Mercy. This is is Pod Have Mercy. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Matt. It's good to see you. (laughs) Good to have you on Pod Have Mercy. Yeah, good to be here. Well, John Stevens is is out this week, Mm -hmm. and um, I think he's also gearing up for this big wedding that's coming up. Yeah. And so... uh, He's a week and a half out, I think. Yeah. 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 Pretty excited about that, too. Um, but today we have um, with us uh, Mark Labertant, who is the president um, of Fuller Theological Seminary. Mm-hmm. It's a, a place that you and I both went to. Yeah. I love Fuller. Yeah. Was that a good experience for you, or how was that for you? It was excellent. I got two degrees there, so okay. I think it was a. <laughs> They're still sending you thank I went you back notes for then. More, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, when I went to uh, look at a seminary, it's literally almost a hundred years ago. Um, there was I really wanted to learn how uh, to think theologically and not denominationally yeah. only, mm-hmm. and, and and so I went and visited some really great schools. Um, uh, one in which I uh, was employed by for a little while. and um, But when I went to Fuller, I realized there's folks from 125 more than that denominations. Yep. And they were, it was in the heart of LA. At the time, the LA riots had just happened. Mm-hmm. And so it was a, a, a city in tension yeah. and was being fractured and pulled apart. And I thought, oh, that's where I want to learn about uh, what it means to yeah. to be a pastor and to be a Christian. It was such rich uh, formation and conversation for me to sit at a Mm -hmm. table, like you're saying, with people from several different denominations uh, to be able to talk about what our God was doing and a part of and how that had formed in so many different ways uh, instead of focusing on so many of the differences, I guess, between denominations. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of talk about denomination when I was there. I mean, we all had our own enclaves that we did that stuff in, but it really was contending with these like Mm -hmm. larger issues. Yeah. I loved it. So, so Mark has been um, the president of Fuller since um, 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, was a pastor for for decades in yeah. the Presbyterian Church, and then I think was a, a professor of preaching homiletics at Fuller, where he he still preaches, um, mm-hmm. um, and he's an amazing amazing preacher. And I've just watched him over the the last few years lead this institution as it shifts mm-hmm. and as it changes and as it. Uh, attempts to discover um, who it is and what it will become in the future of institutions. Yeah. And so I'm really excited about um, this conversation with with him, both a, a leader, a person that I've watched um, for years and really respect. Yeah. And so yeah, excited about this. Thanks Pretty for good. being here. Of course. So one of, one of the things that um, as we kind of just, this is super conversational and, and want to just kind of ramble through some some things, that, particularly on expertise. I've As I've gotten to know you over the last few years, um, I've been just absolutely drawn to you on a couple of levels. One, um, um, that God has you where God has you right now in this moment uh, in history and time um, um, has been really just for such a time as this, I think that you you are where you are at Fuller Seminary and doing what you're doing in terms of helping to translate some of the waters and the season that we're in, because I think it's more than a moment. <laughs> I think it's actually we're, we're making a, a, a really deep shift. And so to you're a person that I have um, kept my eye on in terms of helping to negotiate this space that is somewhat without a map. Um, although there, there's, there's signposts, spiritual signposts, I think, within, but it's more um, being led into a um, terrain that we, we don't know. Um, and I wanted to start just by asking you, what is at the center um, of your own passion? And how would you, how would you describe that? Or how do you um, articulate that? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, you know, when I was in college with the period when I came to Christian faith out of a background of a dad who was just a a dramatic religious skeptic. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I came to my own faith, um, came to faith period uh, of any kind uh, when I was in college. Uh, A few years after college, a friend of mine asked me that question. 
which was really central to my own discernment of what I should do with my life. And her way of stating it was, what is the central question that you most wish people would ask you, but they hardly ever do? And I said, the question, I, I gave it time, as in 24 hours, in fact. <laughs> and, I came, and, I, and I came back to her and I said, well, I think what I would like you to ask me is, what is the center of your passion? And the reason that I want you to ask me that is that the center of, has, of my life has become the most surprising thing I could imagine, which is uh, the discovery of the reality of Jesus Christ mm. and his transformative power, not just on a personal level, but on a social level, meaning a sociological level that I'm invited into not only communion with God, but into communion with uh, others in ways that I could never have imagined and ultimately into a communion of unlike people <laughs> who um, who are also called into that communion with God. And, and I think the big arc of my life and to this very day, to the reason that we're having this conversation is because of that very same thing. It, mm. it is because of my uh, profound gratitude for the passion, not my passion, but the passion of Jesus and um and then for the passion of jesus to lead me into uh a communion with unlike people has been the vocation of my life and the vocation whether it's been as a pastor or as a friend uh as a neighbor as a citizen or now uh, ironically and bizarrely to me but gratefully on most days uh being the president of a theological seminary so <laughs> um and the way that you articulate that is, I find, like, super interesting in some ways because there's, um, like, I grew up in that notion that Jesus animates the center of ourselves, but that that real center is to get us out of the world. You know, as, as yes. Brian McLaren often says, it's a, an evacuation plan for the faithful. Um, yes. Right. And the, the way I hear you articulating that is that it, it roots you into the world and animates you in a different way. Could you... Could you talk about that connection between um, uh, the difference between the this understanding of Jesus getting us out rather than possibly Jesus rooting us in? Yeah, it is so pervasive, I think, in the Gospels. This is how I came to faith. I started reading Gospels, and what shocked me was how much Jesus was an engager hmm. uh, who tracked with people, whoever and wherever they were, and wanted literally, uh, in these technical theological terms like incarnation, wanted to be not only an embodiment of God uh, in his own physical reality, but uh, to embody to us, among us, with us, for us, uh, the presence of God wherever we might be in our life and whatever might be happening in us or around us. That was that was a that was a deal breaker uh, to mm. me that opened up an understanding of Jesus in a way that I had never understood. My dad's uh, life was really given to science and reason, and he was very much a modernist. Mm. And uh, and he saved certain neck veins for the discussion of religion because he really believed that he wanted his two sons to do everything possible to avoid religion and religious devotion. And his main critique was that he he wanted us to avoid what he saw as a historic and, and uh, automatic kind of implication that the more you give yourself to religion and specifically christian religion the more you give yourself to taking great things and making them small wow and uh wow. this kind of critique was pretty devastating yeah. encompassing yeah <laughs> easily proven uh let me count the ways uh you know it's 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 a it's a devastating and yeah. profound critique and um when I started reading the Gospels, what shocked me was, first of all, how much Jesus and my dad had in common on that theme. And then secondly, how Jesus' antidote to small making was not not choosing uh, religious faith or devotion, but grounding it in a, a relationship with the God of the universe mm. made known in Jesus and, and then being invited into this communion of unlike people. Mm. And that was the shocker to me it was like the kingdom of god which is the chief antidote uh is it cracks open the whole universe yeah. and and therefore 
to follow in the way of Jesus is to engage the universe with as much seriousness as the life, death, and resurrection mm -hmm. of Jesus actually embodies mm -hmm. and articulates. Yeah. That pathway has gotten encrusted inside something that that I think we call the church, <laughs> which is often, you know, a multi-layered historical, now ecclesiastical industrial complex that is, let's say, burying the gospel. And so much of the disorientation of this moment is the flagellations and dismemberment and decay and rot that exists inside mm -hmm. this beloved uh, bride of Christ that has given way to so many operational instincts, which mm -hmm. have nothing to do or uh, and, and as much sometimes to do with things that are against Jesus as things that are for Jesus. And, and at the very core, the gospel uh, lies uh, fighting, trying to fight its way out from the church um, for the sake of the world. So, you know, what you just asked me is to me, I was just trying to sketch the background that then makes it so apparent to mm -hmm. me that the primary work of Jesus and the gospel is meant to be in and for the world yeah. for the sake of its own intrinsic value, meaning, beauty, and ultimate fulfillment. <laughs> and um, and not its eradication, yeah. its expungement, its uh, yeah burning up in glory kind of an image um so that's a, that is a very very different vision and uh to me it's one that is just uh, central and and primary yeah it seems also there's an ecological center to that vision as well right you know that it's it's something that continues a heartbeat and a and a soul um you one of the things that i, I find really interesting too is you're in a i mean sarah and i talk about this all the time as we think about kind of the future of the church and kind of in the front lines where we are um uh, in, in local ministry um, and knowing that institutions are shifting and changing, mm -hmm. that it seems that we're in a deep crisis um, in some ways. Our own United Methodist institution is in deep crisis. Um, it seems like, you know, seminaries are in deep crisis as, you know, universities. These are, um, and having come through this year, it feels as if the pandemic has revealed some things, maybe accelerated some things. Um, could you talk about the maybe the crisis uh, that we're in as you see it, and and then I'm I'm also really interested to know and to hear you talk about like the role that institutions might take in the future because uh, they seem to be different than the ones that they've taken up to this point. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I it's my view that uh, I agree with Phyllis Tickle, the writer who's uh, deceased now, but. Um, she was a person who before her death in a number of places made the statement that she thought perhaps we were in one of the churches every 500 years right. periods of redefinition mm -hmm. i i'm taken with that and i of course no one can historically define whether that's really in fact the case but you can certainly acknowledge that it is a, uh it's at least imaginable that if it's not already happening <laughs> it's something like what's happening and or it's certainly something that needs to happen um so i i do think that what we're seeing in a certain way put rather boldly is that that many aspects of the protestant reformation have uh, been sources of great blessing to people millions and millions and millions of people and i think the protestant reformation in a certain way especially regarding the 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 church has really been a project that um that has gone to seed, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and that it's gone to seed in ways that are really understandable. I mean, I say that as a person who's uh, been ordained in the Presbyterian Church for 40 years, as a person who uh, loves local congregations, as a person who uh, really understands, um, I think, a lot about local ministry mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. Um, so it's not it's not trying to be a gadfly of just uh, judgment. It's really just to acknowledge a burden that now seems to have been unveiled. And it was it was already coming to be unveiled, I think, in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do think has, has is that the pandemic has been an accelerant yeah. that has uh, enabled us tragically and painfully to see things about ourselves, to hear things in ourselves and through ourselves, mm -hmm. as well as to hear and see the church reflected back to us by a culture that is often 
um, I would argue in many different ways, not entirely at all, but in many different ways, more reflective of a, of a kind of uh, wisdom and sensitivity to the issues that really matter, sometimes much more than the church has been. Yeah. And while culture may not live it out either, um, that's not, in my view, uh, necessarily the church's responsibility. It is, however, the vocation of the church to live out its identity. And, and I think it's a failure of the church to live out its identity at many very critical points. Mm -hmm. And, and as a result, um, I think the the chaos that we're in right now, racially, ethnically, um, on, on so many different levels and generations across all kinds of traditions uh, inside the U.S., beyond the U.S., there's just plenty of evidences of God's presence and power, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there's also plenty of evidences of a broken church that's divided and hostile against itself and its own primary identity. Um, and and then leaves us really with this ecclesiastical industrial complex to attend to, which is being gravely threatened by the pandemic. And uh, we were uh, talking a moment ago about the significance of church attendance. I think there will be a, a reflowering of local congregations in various ways because people are anxious to be together. Um, but I wonder whether that flowering will be quickly uh, cut flowers that will feel like it's a, it's a fast bloom yeah. because we're eager to be together. But in the long-term arc, something much more profound is now at risk, if not already lost, and and literally has to be both rediscovered mm -hmm. and also reclaimed and then re reformed in in ways that actually manifest themselves mm -hmm. on the ground in personal and institutional ways. What is that thing that needs to be reclaimed and refound? What what is what is that? <laughs> Well, I, my way of stating it is that it's the evangel. Uh, I use that word because it's a it's an English use of a Latin word that often is is synonymous with good news. Uh, I think the evangel is really about mm. uh, God's revelation in and through Jesus Christ that is God's redeeming love and justice uh, for the world, and that's that is the thing that has to be rediscovered. Mm. So that's when you Think, for example, about statements that are now so taken for granted, like let's choose an easy one. The church <laughs> is a business. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a fact. It's, it's a truth. It's a true statement to say the church is a business. Uh, that's why you have lights and microphones and why I do too. Um, so on one level, it's an economic enterprise, and it does involve things that are business and transactional in that way. But if you went back and asked uh, the Gospels to give us evidence that the church or this thing that God has called, the, mm -hmm. those called out, the ecclesia, or the, right. the, the new humanity that God has fashioned because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, it was not for the sake of establishing a business. Okay. Uh, it was for the sake, of, the sake of establishing an unexpected, shocking communion that can only be explained because Jesus died and rose. Now, that's still the center of the church, yes. but yeah. wow, does it seem to me often buried under yeah. crust, uh, yeah. crustacean layers of, um, oh, and let, then let me add this and also let me add that, and wouldn't it be a good idea if, and if we can bring in some more balloons, that would also help. And, <laughs> You know, it, it all just becomes uh, painfully mechanized and mm -hmm. um, and uh, depersonalized and fundamentally de dechristianized. Mm -hmm. Meaning, Jesus Himself becomes a foreigner in this Absolutely. in this body. Absolutely, and um, and that that is a twenty four karat crisis, yeah. and it's not about being left or right politically. It's not about being red or blue, it's not about being white or black or Asian or Latino or Native American. It's it's about that reality that defines all other realities uh, being lost inside the church of all places. Yes. And it seems that we, uh, I mean, you're a, you're a professor and a, a, um, a president of a, sem a seminary where, you know, thinking is placed at a, at a high level, right? And so, so for decades, maybe 
longer than decades. Really, the question is, has, has really been one about what we think uh, as, as a yeah. confession of faith, right? Um, but this, right. this kind of, this embodied sense of how we move in the world um, seems to be um, sublimated secondary, even, you know, down the line, past secondary. I mean, it really is. Yeah. So when we even um, uh, invite folks into the church, we ask them these creedal statements about what they think. Mm. Now, they don't have right. to back that up, you know. Um, right. And so how do we, it seems like some of the vision you're talking about is a reclamation of those centers being much more connected and much more in dialogue um, right. than our thinking center. And it, I mean, one of, the, one of the old adages in recovery is that you can't think yourself into new behavior. Mm. You have to act yourself into a new way of thinking, right? And so there's that that sense yeah. in which, yeah. um, so could, what part, mm -hmm. how, how do we move? It seems like that's going to be an important part of this next season that we not give up. And absolutely. We not give yeah. that up, but we also reclaim. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really important question. And it puts its finger on, I think a lot of the nerves of what have to, has to be grappled with. So, um, if we start with the incarnation, it seems to me that it would be hard for us to bifurcate any dimensions of our lives, whether it's thinking, feeling, embodiment, right, right, right. relationships, <laughs> ideas, uh, creation as a whole, um, right? We can't we can't segment off anything, and we can't, in one sense, um, re reprioritize things as though it should be reasoned at the top and everything else yeah, falls right. down below. That's that's the barrenness that I think you're referring to. That mm -hmm. often then feels like. It's about cognition. It's not really about embodiment. And and that is a completely anti-incarnational vision, right? Jesus didn't come as a brain on a stick to deliver information to us. He, he came to us as an embodied human being who shares our human experience and who demonstrates to us shocking thought on one level. So in one sense, Jesus is absolutely a thinker whose ideas and parsing of language and expressions Absolutely. of truth are yeah. extremely important to his teaching. At the same time, right seamlessly alongside that is the enacted demonstration <laughs> of the things that he's talking about. So I, I always love that part at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus gives this text that we now call the Sermon on the Mount, five to seven in Matthew. And, and then he tells the story of the, the parable of building your house on rock and mm -hmm. sand. And he does so as a as a wise person, acknowledging that there are people that are going to hear this and think maybe even amen to the ideas. But then he says, but the whole thing turns on whether you build your house on the rock. And the rock is not in that parable. The rock is not um, the, the faith. It's whether or not you actually are prepared to do the truth rather than just <laughs> yeah. think about the yes. truth or say amen to the truth or passionately sing for the sake of the truth, <laughs> but actually live the truth. And then in this completely unremarkable, but astounding way, the text just rolls into Matthew 8, which is the very first thing that when they come down from the mountain is to, encountering, to, is to encounter a person with leprosy. Yeah. Mm. So it's as though that the, the gauntlet is, has been thrown down by Jesus himself. Are you going to live the truth or just say the truth? You encounter a leper. You're supposed to stay ritualistically pure by not encountering, let alone touching <laughs> the leper. And, and Jesus encounters it. The person cries out for healing. Jesus says, I do choose. He touches him, calls him son, and, and heals him. Then intensifying it even more. It, the text then moves from, are you going to love people who might stain you into the next section of the text, which is his encounter with the Roman centurion, mm. which is this amazing text of encountering literally the enemy of Israel, the, the force that kept Israel from being Israel in Israel's mind. And the, the centurion comes forward as a, as a Roman officer and says he needs help from Jesus for him, not for himself, but for his servant. Mm. And Jesus says, I'll come. He says, no, 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 you don't even need to do that. Just say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. Mm -hmm. Jesus slows down the action and says, did all of you hear this? <laughs> I have not heard a statement about that kind of faith in all of, of Israel. Israel. Yeah. There are people inside the house who will be found in the outer darkness. Uh, and there will be others who now 
appear to be in the outer darkness, who will be inside the house. And his faith will be one of the enduring witnesses to the reality mm -hmm. of the kingdom. Now, that that's an astounding disruption, right? And, and it's all part of not just loving people who sustain us, but literally demonstrating what it means to love our enemies. Right. Yeah. And to find in our enemies, sometimes, not always, sometimes an unexpected presence of grace mm. that might actually rebuke and redefine even our own. Now, if that's not enough to upset about a thousand apple carts about our assumptions around <laughs> ministry and how we perceive our neighbor and how we engage in work and what what is this work that Jesus is calling us to imitate, all of that, I think, is why it involves thought. It does involve thought. It involves every part of our perception, every part of our capacity to love beyond our human bounds. I could go on, but you get the yeah. you get the strain of what I'm saying. Um, how do you react to that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I keep um, the thing that keeps circling in my head while we're talking about all this as well as um, I think that Christianity has become so hyper individualized. Am yeah. I saved? Do to reference back, Matt, to what you shared earlier, do I have my exit plan? Do I, am right. I taking care have my of my exit plan? Right. Yeah, right. You know, like, right. It, it, Are my affairs in, 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 in order? Right. Yeah. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's become so um, yeah. individualized that we lose the community, yeah. right? We don't, yes. we're not yes. even thinking about the leper or the Roman centurion in terms of our faith because we're, it's, it, Christianity has come to mean a, a formula for me on my own. We've lost this, right. this kingdom mindset, right? Yeah. Um, right, right. And, yeah. Yeah. And that's intensified, Sarah, inside the United States, as you know, yeah. because that's so endemic to culture. So right. at the heart of that crisis is really the intersection between faith and culture. Yep. And, and the evidence that the church has in the whole arc of American history been prone to it and it, this kind of intense uh rugged individualism that you're referring to and then spiritualized and yes. theologized around it rather right. than challenged it fundamentally right. Right? right so we've simply absorbed it into this thing called church mm -hmm. we then build a structure around supporting individualism which then serves up to the individual the kind of religious faith that that an individual would want and and desire yeah, yeah. Right. that's just not the kingdom's project Right. And hopefully if we've been listening and tuned in during this pandemic, right, we see how harmful that is for us as a culture to be so individualized and then to have people feel so cut off from one another. Mm -hmm. um, and really, yes. like you're saying, the opportunity for the church to be able to step in and some, yeah. we have a, uh, this could be a profound moment yeah. for the church right. in a bunch of ways. Absolutely. It okay. could be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It absolutely could be. And, and I think pertinent to Phyllis Tickle's comment again, I think it is a moment for reconsidering, mm -hmm. re-envisioning, remaking church. Yeah. And uh, and I, I think it's essential that you in your settings, that I in my settings, uh, do everything possible to actually try to be seminal, not to be mm. imitative, not to be uh, pandering, not to be uh, fiddling with, um, with the edges when in fact there's really fundamental work to be done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think, you know, in the African-American tradition, the Black church tradition, and, and also in some white churches in the South especially, um, the, the whole revival tradition, that every mm. year there needs to be a revival. And and often the way that's articulated historically is that it was really about the revival by reaching out to people who had not yet come to faith. But when you read some of the preaching that has, that, uh, that has gone on during those revival periods, what you also discover is that that it was also very plain to many of those evangelists that they were actually calling the church back mm, to itself mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and not and not just kind of the the people who may have been invited uh, 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 to come to the tent meeting. Yeah, yeah. So that's a very important, it's a double revival, right? It's always mm. about the transformation of the church. So where is it that the church is being called back to its fundamental essence as mm -hmm. opposed to... Um, remanufacturing mm. some new version uh, with better technology and screens for the ecclesiastical industrial complex. Mm -hmm. That is just not the salvation of the world. Yeah. And um, how we understand that, I have nothing against the use of technology or, uh, or most other things, 
for this purpose. They're just not primary. And, and to distract ourselves by that thinking that if we just get the technology right, mm -hmm. uh, the church can reassert a healthy voice is as bankrupt as any other kind of assumption about technique. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, I, lo I love this conversation in that um, there's a part of me that's a skeptic that says um, uh, people can only handle so much um, chaos, disequilibrium, e right? Mm -hmm. And that we're coming out of this pandemic. And will there be, in a sense, those cut flowers that you talk about, that desire to go back to the way it was mm -hmm. and then to almost um, at, a, at a visceral sense um, constrict around that um, as, yes. a, as a way of controlling. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. There's another part of me that feels like, you know, Elvis has left the building. <laughs> you know, the spirit is gone. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the world. Something quantumly different is happening. And the way I hear you um, talk about even just the Roman centurion or the leper, that points to the signposts of the way that we could be looking towards what is happening. I mean, mm -hmm. Stephen Verney says I, one of the names of God can be translated as something is happening. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I love and, that. Yeah. And so I wonder um, at this point, um, in your own um, purview, what what are some of the capacities that the church, in a sense, um, has to get right in this season? I mean, really yeah. has to has to take on and say we've got to get this right in order to move with the spirit in, as it's already in the world. Yeah, yeah, so critical. Um, well, some of the angles of vision that have, have certainly attracted me a great deal um, is, is the way that the black church in many ways presents possibly the greatest hope for the American church. Mm -hmm. um, and I say it that way because yeah. I think they are a church that has from the very beginning understood themselves to be a church in exile. Mm -hmm. That I think is a very, very important thing for us to reclaim yes. that, that we are actually meant to be exiles. We're not meant to be um living in a promised land and that picture of america as the promised land in which uh quote the presence of christians in american life and the dominance of the church and so forth is actually the keeper of an american version of promised land mm -hmm. becomes in totally wrapped around all this the black church is is utterly clear that that project had problems from the beginning and <laughs> um and so there's that second thing is I think their ability to negotiate disordered power, which of course is the primary paradigm of their yes. cultural location and um, and as victims of power, the white church in America has, has controlled power. It has asserted power. It's maintained and nurtured power in various ways, which is part of the battle that's going on uh, even now. And, and in that process, the white church has often, I think, become distracted by power rather than actually by uh, the, the, the aroma of a distinctive gospel that can mm -hmm. not only live, but sometimes even thrive in chaos and brokenness yes. rather yeah. than in the security of, of dominance. I think uh, that's another reason. I think another reason is that they have learned one of the hardest things for the white church in America to learn, which is the ability and the, and the experience of knowing deep joy in the middle of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. White culture just tends not to ever want to believe that that could ever be possible, or it's it's part of getting our rescue plan. Okay, I may have to suffer, but I'm gonna make sure I have the world's best insurance. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> so, let me tell, tell you a story. Uh, um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Some more editing opportunity for your crew. <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> So when I became a Christian, I in college, I told my parents this, and my dad, of course, was extraordinarily disheartened <laughs> by this uh, fact. And my my mom uh, was sort of quietly reawakened to her faith, and she mm. went to a church and met a pastor and told her pastor that that this that her son had had some kind of religious experience. So this pastor says to her, "Well, I'd love to come and call on him then." So on an otherwise perfectly wonderful day, uh, up up comes this pastor for my first pastoral visitation and we have a few moments of some fairly awkward conversation and then he says um 
He says, well, really, I've come for three reasons. The first is that your mom has told me that you've had some kind of religious experience. The second reason is that that might mean you're going to become a pastor. Now, this was not even semi-remotely uh, <laughs> on, on, my, on my bandwidth. And, and thirdly, if you do become a pastor, I want to make sure that you know which denomination has the best pension plan. <laughs> That did not happen, did it? <laughs> that happened. As reported, that is what happened. <laughs> so that night at dinner, uh, I tell my parents what happened in this conversation. And uh, my mom is just so embarrassed and horrified. My dad um, my dad is quiet. He said, it was, was a ger- very gentle, spirited guy. And uh, he said, now, Mark, you do know this is what we've been talking about, right? Don't you suppose that maybe when this mm-hmm. man was uh, as young as you, that he too thought he was getting to know the God of the universe. But here he is all these years later coming to a new convert to his faith that he uh, is professionally employed to represent. And he comes to call on you for the first time and he offers you mm-hmm. a job and a pension plan. <laughs> and I have to say, yeah. uh, there are in life defining moments. And I would say that day is one of those defining moments, right? Because it's so clearly exemplified everything that my dad had said was the yes. danger. Yeah. Yeah. And it was now vividly held up by the representative of the faith that I believe was the rescue from this, uh, this devoid smallness of being human yeah. actually. Um, as well as the smallness of being Christian at times. And so, so what happens in all that is the, that it represents now, of course, looking back on all of these years, it represents uh, one of those experiences that I realized was one of the best evident warnings mm-hmm. of exactly where all this can go if you simply let yourself go there. Right. And all of that is completely counter to the idea of Jesus saying, I've come that you might have mm-hmm. life and life abundantly. Right. Uh, right. That is not actually defined by a pension plan, it turns out. Um, <laughs> not that funny. I'm not grateful yeah. that I have one. Um, I will say, for, for your sake, that, uh, that he did say that the best pension plan was the United Methodist Church. So <laughs> I don't know how you feel about your pension plans, but uh, that, that was his particular and, argument. And, and that's, um, why, that's what attracted Sarah and I. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. This exactly. close to becoming a presby, well, but no. Yes, yes, but no. Better pension plan. Better pension I know. plan. I, I knew it. I thought that one might be true. <laughs> That's funny. I one of yeah. the things I'm realizing in this uh, as you're speaking that um, that I, it was a I think I heard, I heard this from um, the sojourners that 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 part of the problem with American Christianity is just that. It's American Christianity, mm. and that part right. of the moment that we're in today um, is that there is a great um, a, apocalyptic move. There's a there's a uncovering, a revealing, in a sense yes. that there's so many of um, both um, folks that I was pastors with that have just left and some who have left the church. There's a dearth right. of young people that are coming. I had someone say to right. me a couple years ago, the church is answering questions no one is asking. Um, and right. it's as if um, we have created that, like you had said, that body of Christ. We've buried the gospel mm. so deep that, um, that, that there is this, I feel like there's almost this earthquake that's needing to happen to mm-hmm. unearth it. Right. Um, right. And- well, you know, it's interesting you use that image because uh, we're all aware that the cicadas are starting to appear yeah. or oh, on yeah. the cusp of appearing. And um, yeah. that undulation has always struck me as an interesting example of the activity of the gospel. It's probably not common to equate the gospel <laughs> with cicadas. <laughs> But uh, but let me let me see. How we'll this give you some, plays some, out. some rope on this, yeah. Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll call it a, a little poetic license here. I'm just I'm just saying it's you know they come up, right. they do their work, they mate, they then go down for 17 mm-hmm. years, then they reemerge. Actually, interestingly, they do reemerge as cicadas. So it's really uh-huh. interesting if if it's allowed to reemerge, they are still cicadas. That is a funny sentence I realized, but I'm just meaning it in the sense that 
that it's not like they somehow are going to come up and be different the next time. They're actually mm. wanting to surface as cicadas to do cicada, cicada propagation <laughs> and then they go down. But but the question is, as the bar- ch- church is buried the gospel, then it seems in, to me that we're in a period where things are emerging yes. from underneath the cross. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, and some of it is really evidently, to me, very evidently evangel-centric. And other things that are emerging are not really evangel-centric. They're, they're, uh, and they're not really even very secularized or very Christian or secularized version of Christian ideas. So whether it has to do with our, our sense of anthropology, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be in communion? What does it mean to, uh, to do many, many things? It's not distinctively Christian. So let me use a, a hot button thing. Like um, in higher education, especially, but in business too, uh, the questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion are extremely important, and and I endorse that. They are extremely important, but as vocabulary, they don't capture a Christian vision of a new humanity. Mm. They capture a minimum, not a maximum. So as long as we understand <laughs> that that we're going for the minimum, and that we're so far below the minimum that surely diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion is the right minimum, fine. And and if we hold it in that way. Hooray. But when the church interchangeably uses DEI language as though you're using language that is descriptive of the fullness of what mm-hmm. God intends in a, in a new humanity, new humanity is not DEI. New humanity is utterly transformed human compassion, mercy, and justice mm-hmm. that's a reflection of nothing less than the life of God. That's that's the much bigger vision. So should we do DEI? Well, of course we should do DEI. I mean, that's like saying yeah. we should guard the welfare of every human being made in the image of God in all the necessary ways. Amen. We should be yeah. doing that. And yeah. that's a gigantic goal and elusive in its own right. right. But that's why it's so important that when we reemerge, we reemerge with news, not just about DEI, we reemerge with news about a transformed mm. reality, which obviously having just celebrated Easter yesterday, um, just puts back on the table again, the sense that that is, it's a much more profound thing we're talking about. We're not just talking about the hope of spring or talking about doing better or the sun is back or any of those things, all that's completely legitimate and wonderful encouragement. But but there it's an encouragement only because it points to something far beyond mm-hmm. itself. C.S. Lewis made a great deal of this mm-hmm. uh, in his own reflections. And I think a lot of his writing, especially in his book, Till We Have Faces, is an mm-hmm. example of, of this movement to something much more um, substantial and profound. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's, that's beautiful. Um, I have like 15 questions that got lost in that for me. <laughs> 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 Um, Sorry for my barrage of language. No, it was, it, well, part of that, part of what I hear you saying is that in, in some ways that we, um, and I think Brueggemann talks about this, this crisis of imagination mm-hmm. that we yes, have, right. and that that yeah. we have we have set we have set our sights um, so far in yeah. to where even when we talk about equity, that is a stretch for some Christians. Yeah. Well, you know, right. that, that, that then gets hyper politicized yeah. and right. it becomes right. in these agendas that, that then become, as you've said, inculcated within American versions yeah. of kind of spirituality that really are about political social moves. Right. That's right. And that, that there seems to be something deeply sinister and death dealing about that construct. Um, right. um, and that, um, that there is a new imagination that must emerge Mm -hmm. that has to take root. Um, and how, uh, and I'm thinking we live in Houston, Texas, which I love. And I'm glad that we're here because I think it's probably the most exciting place to do ministry. I'm, I know I'm a little um, biased in that, (laughs) that regard, but, but, but for this, it is a very exciting place. It's an amazing place. It is. But we're, but also I think that often white Christians here, the Christian church here writ large is um, still under the auspice that if we can just get to, you know, equity and diversity, we have reached it rather than that being even, we've just put our hand on the door. We haven't even opened the door once we've done that. Right, right, right. Um, right. And, well, yeah. going back to the centurion as an example of just mm. this, right? It's 
Yeah. It's not just that we got to equity with the centurion. He's allowed to speak to a Jewish rabbi with a great following. No, mm. that, I mean, you might call that equity. I heard your voice. It fully registered. I get it. I can tell it back to you. No, instead, it's welcomed like all the way into the inner being of Jesus, who then <laughs> incorporates it as a declaration for the sake of the enemy of Rome. Right. And yes. that's just like an astounding different response not just a kind of oh yeah let's let the centurion have his voice no that's not that's not the vision that's an equity vision yes that's not a kingdom vision and the equity vision for we know for reasons we know is a huge enough goal i'm not trying to lose us here in abstraction of idealism that would be that would be crushing to what i think the kingdom is about it's not meant to be an abstraction or a, a mere eternity i think we are on that we're meant to be on that road now and that's why Jesus says everywhere that this man's story is told, uh, it will go forth with with such power and influence because it's it's a foretaste. But Jesus at that moment is also amplifying it as a foretaste of the kingdom. That's great. Right? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Talk about recentering voices. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Can um I know we probably need to wrap up here. Can I ask you a couple rapid fire questions? Of course. <laughs> if that's if that's is possible. it possible for Mark Labberton to give a short yeah, answer? Right. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, what does worship and justice have to do with each other? Hmm. Well, I think worship is fundamentally about the right ordering of power, and justice is doing the same. So, hmm. uh, justice is enacting the right ordering of power, and what worship does is is reframing how we understand the power of God, the power of our own lives, the power of government, the power of money, the power of sin, the power of, of so many other things in our life. Worship should help bring clarity to that. So that then in doing justice, we are enacting our worship by rightly, we're tending a world of disordered power. And we're trying to reorder it, not to make it the church, but to make it reflective of a recipient of the goodness of God's vision of a healthy reordering that will allow for human thriving. Hmm. I'm going to try not to cuss on this podcast, but <laughs> that was good. Yeah. That was good. Mo most of the places that um, I walk into, there's a sense in which um, um, particularly large churches will invite people to the table, but they want to make sure that mm -hmm. um, they let everybody around the table know that they own that table. Mm. Right. Um, right. And right. that that right worship disorders that power. There there is I think that we right. in so many ways that we haven't talked enough, we haven't explored enough the the whole notion of kenosis mm -hmm. within this right. dynamic. Right. 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 Like if that sits at right. the core of it, we we, right. we we don't know what that means. No. Yeah, exactly. Can I come back to one of Please. your earlier questions which I didn't yeah. answer but which relates to this Please. and that has to do with the roles of the role of institutions because if you're going to talk about kenosis which is uh, a greek word for emptying self-emptying um that the question is how do institutions self-empty yeah. right yes um it's a it's an enormous thing if a person can self-empty right mm. if we if we can practice lives of, of genuinely releasing on our prerogatives but how do institutions do that and actually sustain themselves for the sake of the of the good that they're trying to do not i mean there's the selfishness that institutions have uh, often at their core as well but if you just partition that out just artificially for a moment and just say okay the core of the intention is good but the enactment of it is really mostly self-serving how do you lay down your interests in self-serving in order to actually live into an identity of actually helping to remake some part of the human experience mm -hmm. that that institution is meant to contribute to. Wow. And it's oh, wow. very, very hard to do that. And uh, I don't think actually that the Bible argues for um, a flat egalitarianism in which all things are simply equal and nobody's voice should be given more attention than others. I think the Bible's replete with examples of God anointing leaders and, and communities of people to be embodiments of, of exceptional reality. Mm -hmm. And insofar as an institution is is an embodiment of that exceptional reality that can't be made by an individual but must be made in communion with the others mm -hmm. then it's a good thing but when in fact 
it gets stopped because of the self-interest of people in the system or institution, or the system itself has too many obligations to its own survival. Um, so like you, many pastors that I talk to are concerned about the church on lots of levels, but among the levels is what will the pandemic do to whether or not people come back to church? How will the institution of church mm -hmm. continue? Will, will people's buildings be able to be lit and heated? Uh, will they have to, will, will they be able to be maintained? Will property have to be sold? Will the physical reality and manifestation of a church, not least a tall steepled church, so-called uh, in various parts of most major cities are, are enactments of an institutional presence, which, I, which in many ways is really powerful and important, but which is never uncompromised. Yes. So what do you make of all that, right? Um, being where you are in Houston, uh, gives you an opportunity to reflect on those questions. Mm. What um, what does being the president of a seminary, um, um, what insight does it give you to the church uh, right now? Um, like, what would you want to say to the local church, to pastors in the local church, uh, from the space you are in terms of just preparing the next generation of pastors or psychologists and uh, missiologists coming out into the world? What would, what, what are some insights you might give to um, to us? Is this meant to be one of my short answer questions? No, you know what? Um, I, can I just say I gave up on the rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, we're going to edit that out, Mark. There's no rapid fire here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's just pathetic. Uh, and, and it's pathetic. I will say I'll take responsibility for being too wordy. But I'll also say that what we are talking about are some yeah. of the most profound things mm -hmm. in the world. Absolutely. And, uh, and my words, as many as they may be, are honestly a tiny fraction yeah. of, of the thought and and the um, the care that just needs to be demonstrated in every possible way for the for the life and well-being mm -hmm. of the church for the sake of its mission mm -hmm. in the world. Um, so let me come to your question. I think uh, I would first just say that my response to this moment um, is often just uh, just very sad and mm -hmm. full of a lot of weeping actually for the church and for the multi-generational devastation of the gospel in the name of Jesus in the public square in America in the last several years. So I start um, in part with that response. Mm. I start also with um, the, the privilege of so many friendships of people across every conceivable uh, racial barrier who I know and love and who yes. for whom uh, their lives feel as present to me as I could imagine people's lives being present to me as a person that's not them. And to feel the the weight of their life and their own anger and their own mm. confusion, uh, their skepticism, their doubt, their fear, everything. Um, and that that's true of people that, that are pastors as well. And um, and it, it it is just an extraordinarily um, painful t time. Now, right alongside that, all the way, are evidences of this just unbelievable grace of God that sustains mm -hmm. people, that keeps people, that grounds them, um, that keeps giving them hope, uh, that keeps nourishing communities, that uh, causes people to take fresh acts of imagination and put them into, uh, into some form that others can actually experience and uh, good that can be done and justice that can be sought and so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, I think the, the importance of attending to your own emotional well-being, your own relational well-being, your own body. Mm -hmm. um, this period of time for me has been, I, could, I knew right off the bat that the pandemic was either going to be a, disastrous for my, a disaster for my physical health or that it might actually be a goad toward health. And <laughs> at least up to now, I'll say it's been a tremendous goad toward health. Yeah, and, um, and even if a person feels like it hasn't been a go toward health. I would just encourage anyone listening to this to to attend to their own physical health, their emotional health, their own yeah. mental health. I think beauty and making are critical, even if you don't think of yourself as, quote, an artist. Um, just the importance of beauty in your life, the, yeah. the importance of, yeah. of making in your life, whatever it is that you might make, mm -hmm. especially something that's not making for the sake of the church, just a making of whether it's of food 
or whether it's of uh, something you might construct or whether it's uh, something you might create, uh, a painting, a poem, um, mm. not because of, of a belief that uh, artistic expression is, is, is um, I do think it's of the essence of being human, but I don't think it's, it manifests itself for the sake of anybody other than uh, you and your community. So it may be for you and your family or you and your circle of friends or you and your small group mm. or you and your congregation or whatever mm. it may be. But this making, 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 we are makers. We love and follow a making God. And we, <sighs> we bring energy and life and vitality to ourselves and to others by, by inviting yeah. people into making with us. Um, that, that is so different than just having social media conversations. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose in quotation marks, I could say it's a form of making, but uh, mm. it's not making like I'm describing. I'm talking yeah. about physical things done in the world yeah. that are forms of, taking the substance of the mm. earth and and experiencing it and uh touching it and holding it and putting it uh to some purpose mm. Mm. thank you thank you thank you yeah thanks for joining us today um, of I've, course i've got like 12 other questions i'd like to ask you <laughs> can, I, can i ask one more and this is a, this is a rapid fire one it could be i don't know Okay, I'll try. Okay. I'll try. I'll um, try. One of the ones, one of the questions I've been, I've been thinking about is Christian Wyman, a poet that I, I, I just love. Yeah. Um, he talks mm -hmm. about that there are some words that have been so wounded mm -hmm. that we can't use them. And I have begun to wonder in the last few years if the word evangelical is a word that has been wounded to a place that, that has been taken somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and right. and how I would have defined myself in that way earlier on, I um, I've been asking people to say, you know, when people ask me, even if I'm a Christian, I say, well, you you tell me what a Christian is, and I'll tell you <laughs> if I'm that, you know, <laughs> right, you know? right. And so, would right. you um, would you help um, maybe negotiate some of that language? How do you how do you understand that? Well, I used this phrase uh, earlier in our interview, but. Um, I think it's first and foremost the recovery of the evangel um, and a distinction between the evangel and the ickalisms. So if evangelicalism is okay. evangel plus ickalism, I'm saying let's go for the recovery of the evangel. Okay. Um, mm. There is no Christian faith or meaning or purpose without the evangel. Mm. Um, that is, that's irreducible. And by it, I'm not meaning... Um, what I make of the evangel, I'm talking about the evangel itself, mm -hmm. namely, was there, is there a God who came in Jesus Christ, who lived, suffered, died, rose, and sent his spirit in order that we might become his followers? That's what I mean by evangel. I'm not yet adding anything more to it than <laughs> that reality, which is the reality from which everything else is meant to be generated. So yeah. I want to be radically evangel-centric and ask, what does that evangel, who is that evangel? What does that evangel teach? How does that get lived? How does it get shared? Mm -hmm. And what are its implications? Okay, so that's the project that to me is central. The ickalisms that I use, dismembering evangelicalism, the ickalism of the second half of the word is, are things that, that may be good or bad. It depends on the thing that you might be attached to, but whether it's good or bad, it is discretionary from the evangel itself. That's good. It's, That's good. It is a, it is a, an, an additional step, which may have been taken for justified and, and legitimate and still maintained reasons, or it may be completely corrupted, false, mm. and, and a crock that should be just, mm. you know, abandoned uh, and fled from and repented of and lamented over in order to be able to actually come back to the evangel the itself. So I prefer to call myself evangel centric. And then because that word is a little unusual, people will say, well, what does that mean? And I go, well, I say to myself, that's just what I want you to ask. <laughs> like, what does, what does that, that mean? mean? Now that's a conversation worth having. Yes. Whereas yeah. the conversation about what is evangelical or not, from my point of view, is not a conversation at this stage that isn't anywhere near a first order question. No, it's an interesting question. It's a historic question. It has what, whatever. That is not. That's not my question. My question is, yes. what is the evangel? Mm. 
Yeah. And what is and, and what does it mean to say that your life or your institution or your church is evangel centric? Mm -hmm. That's Beautiful. the defining question. Mm -hmm. And the ecclesms are a matter that history will take care of. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, thank you again for um, joining us uh, today. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all that you're doing in, in the world. Um, Sarah and I both love going to Fuller yeah. <laughs> and the way it's shaped us to um, uh, uh, for our own ministries and lives. So, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, I, let me say a couple things about, uh, about that. One is that Fuller is embracing the same conversation in a very deep way. And yes. the the leading banner for our strategic plan for the next three to five years is rethinking church for the 21st century. Uh, not rethinking it, I pray, in the way that you rightly warned earlier, namely thinking that it's a brain exercise instead of yeah. uh, instead of it being a holistic. But we're really talking about the reconception mm -hmm. and then the repracticing, the remaking of church at a sort of seminal level, not yes. at a tactical or strategic level, but at a seminal level, what is this new work of God? Uh, mm -hmm. And and how does it get uh, rediscovered? Yes. And then how does it begin to begin to uh, be lived out? Um, so in a way, it's a frame that's beyond what we've just been talking about, but it encompasses many of the things you've asked about. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, uh, Sarah, I don't know you as well, and I'm, I was doubly delighted to uh, discover that you're a double graduate from Fuller, so that's <laughs> uh, a great thing. And mm -hmm. I gather you're moving into a new position, so I'm yeah. excited about what next steps that will hold, which is really great. Yes. Um, Matt, you know that I've, I've said this to you many times, mm -hmm. that I feel like God has given you a, a very unique blend of, of capacities, instincts, mm -hmm. yeah. um, a history that you continue to harvest uh, for good, Mm -hmm. and uh, and a capacity to be able to lean into some of the most important intersections that I think mm -hmm. exist. And uh, and your courage and your creativity and your humility and your humor in being able to do all that is uh, is, is really just a balm to me. I have so many mm -hmm. reasons why I delight in you, but, but those, <laughs> those are some of the lists. And uh, so getting to have this conversation today is, is also a privilege for that reason. Thank you. The check is in the mail. <laughs> because <laughs> we all know a lot of money is made on ipods <laughs> i suppose it is for some but not in this case I, all my friends yeah. are gonna say how much you pay mark Riverton to say that yeah. about you yeah. yeah 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 they all know it's true they all know it's true you're a gift to us mark thank you so much well thanks so much god bless you all right you too yeah. okay bye now well i'm matt russell I'm Sarah Barnett. And this is Pod Have Mercy.